what am I going to talk about this evening? Um, I'll give a little bit of an introduction to myself, my background, why this is a topic that interests me. I'm going to give a short introduction to human factors. I assume it's a topic that majority of you will have had some contact with, sometimes a lot, maybe just as passing understanding, but just to make sure we're all on the same level with that. And I'm then going to start digging into human error itself, talking about what it is, why it happens, and fundamentally what we can do about it. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about what we can do about it. I'm going to focus on the design side. Um, my current role is very much um, as a design engineer, looking at how we can focus on the design to improve things. And um, hopefully, as we talk about human error, you'll see why I think that is really where we should be focusing and where we can have the most impact to um, achieve the performance we're looking for. And then obviously I'll wrap up and uh, have a few suggestions for some further reading if some of this has whetted your appetite to talk about today. So a little bit about me, um, compulsory picture of picture in front of an aircraft. So as Bernard says, I'm currently working at Lockheed Martin UK Amped Hill, uh, working primarily on um, design of systems and to integrate the user effectively. Before that, I was over at uh, MOD, and there I was first said looking at flight safety, and what that broke down with was looking at the accident investigation side, looking at um, working with units to understand where human factors issues could be impacting on performance, and helping develop mitigations very much at the operator end of the scenario. Before that, I was at Kinetic for 10 years, doing a range of different roles. And while I was there, I did my occupational psychology masters. Um, since then, I've become chartered and also trained as an accident investigator. And really, the reason I get interested and excited about human factors is because I think it's where a lot of the complexity of real life comes together and you can start looking at those problems to, to the benefit of the user and their well-being. So um, human factors, it's, you would start with a definition, don't you? This is the one from the International Ergonomics Association, which suspect that you're familiar with. Some of the key elements in it is the fact that it's a scientific discipline. It's very much evidence-based and we're looking to build our understanding of people and their role within the system. But the other key word I like to pull out from this is interaction because I really think that's where human factors brings it. We're not just about the people, we're about how they interact with the systems, the processes and so on. And I much prefer a diagram to a textual definition. So this is a, it's a diagram, but it's very much based on the shell model of human factors, which looks at the different elements in the system. So the people within it, the liveware, how they interact with each other. Also how they interact with their equipment, the hardware, with the processes and systems, the software and the environment with which they operate. And fundamentally human factors is about that little bit right in the middle there where all of those things come together. And um, this is where I talk about the complexity and the reality of how systems are used, um, which is what I find really interesting. We don't try and simplify things too much, although we do study things in a scientific way. We look, accept the complexity of the world as it is and try and work with that. We're very much about the reality, the lived experience, the operator's perspective on using the system and looking at how all of that comes together to support well-being and performance. So moving on to error, human factors was pretty, pretty straightforward to define. Um, human error, not so much. I find this one a little bit problematic. Um, there's lots of different definitions out there. They all focus on quite different things. The only two parts of it that you can see is consistent throughout the definition is the fact that there is a human involved somewhere in the system. We are talking about human error, so there is a person somewhere. And some idea of deviation, that we're not performing in the manner that was expected in some way. Maybe it was expected, but we're, we're deviating from something. Um, but what exactly we're deviating from and in what way is quite, is quite difficult to nail down. So why is that? Why is this such a hard concept? To understand. The first thing is it's not always clear, no this is certainly my experience, it's not always clear what the right thing to do is. Um, 
In some situations, there might be a very clear structured course of action, but the argument that a plan never passes first contact, what do we then do when things go wrong against that initial plan? How do we adapt to it? How do we make those decisions? People are very adaptable. People are very good at coping with that uncertainty and managing it, but it does mean that it isn't always clear the correct course of action. Second point there is the one that's quite common in a lot of definitions, is placing an emphasis on the outcome of the situation rather than on the action that was performed. So often we only get interested in undertaking a big investigation when there's a really serious impact. But often we, we make many mistakes in our lives, many errors take place with no consequence at all. Might do something slightly wrong when you're cooking your dinner, but the dinner was still okay but the error still occurred, but we'd probably never even spot those kinds of errors. We'd certainly brush them away quite easily. Go, oh, it was fine because everything turned out okay. But that doesn't mean that something interesting didn't happen on the way and there could be some learning for that and there could be something that can prevent a harm type outcome in the future. The next one I think is really interesting is the idea of action or inaction. So sometimes the error is a conscious thing. It's something that you, you did, you should have done X and you actually did Y. Sometimes an error can take place just by simply not doing something. Not doing something in the situation where you expected it to happen. That starts to become a lot more difficult to define than something where we're seeing, um, seeing one of these more specific decision-making type errors taking place. They can also encompass things that we didn't mean to do and things that we did mean to do. Um, I sometimes think one of the intentional that we can be talking about sometimes these big political decisions that we often try to look back and we think, yes, of course I intended to do that. That was exactly what I planned to do. That was definitely my, my intention all along, especially if it led to a good outcome. And perhaps if it didn't, then it was maybe something we didn't mean and we'll think about that a little bit differently. But actually an error can encompass both of those things. They could be something we intended to do. They could be something we completely did by accident, as can correct actions. So how does this really, how do things really differ between something that's an error and something that's not? And the main point that really underlies all of that is that the context is absolutely critical. Is it the situation in which that action or that inaction takes place is fundamental to defining what the correct action was to take, whether the outcome was positive or negative, whether it was an action, an inaction, whether it was intentional or accidental, um, all of that surrounded by the context. And when we've got something that's so context dependent, it can be very hard to put a definition of it. So that's kind of my starting point. If oh, this human error is a very convenient sounding concept, when we start to scratch below the surface and think, what do we really mean by that? It starts to become a little bit more challenging to work with. So this hasn't stopped very many eminent human factor specialists, academics working on this topic, because this is clearly something we interest. Errors are associated with significant losses of life, of assets, and getting this right is something really important. So what I'm going to talk through next is a couple of different categorization approaches, which was the first approach to really trying to understand human error in more detail. And uh, the first one I'm going to talk through is Rasmussen's model. And what Rasmussen tried to do was break down error into three different types, which he called skill-based, rule-based, knowledge-based. And he defined these different types of errors based upon the type of task that was being performed at the time. So a skill-based task is something that we perform. It's very simple, it's very automatic. A classic skill-based task would be something like driving a car. I often think of tooling actions are often very skill-based. So spanner turning, ratcheting, some of these very practiced, very familiar tasks that we perform many, many times a day. A rule-based task is again something that can be quite defined, but here we're talking about something that's more of your if-then type action. So where you're actually making a decision, if this, I'm assessing the situation, I'm identifying this, and I'm making a, an action based on it. And errors in that type, as we've seen classified as rule-based. 
Knowledge-based errors are going into more novel situations. So situations that you may not have a set of procedures, a set of rules, or a lot of experience in, and how, and how errors can arise in those situations. And what I've tried and trying to do to talk through this is this model is picked out some different errors. I've picked out some specific errors and I've picked out some well-known accident scenarios. And I've had a go at trying to map them against some of this to illustrate where it can help, but perhaps where it can be more challenging. So to pick a nice everyday example, I like error in cooking because it happens quite a lot to me. And so one that we could think of as being a skill-based error would be weighing out the wrong amount of flour in a recipe. It's pretty straightforward. We're just tipping it in. We tip too much flour in, we make an error. It sounds quite skill-based. However, again, when we start thinking how context is critical, that might not necessarily be the reason that error took place. We might have weighed out the wrong amount of flour because we're trying to work out a third of the original quantity in the recipe because we're not cooking for quite so many people. And we've actually made a rule-based error of how to conduct that analysis, uh, conduct that um, calculation. So something that sounds quite obviously school-based and quite uh, simple can some potentially, because of context, sit somewhere else. At the other end of the spectrum, I mentioned this one because it's a problem I'm trying to deal with in my house, which is not being able to find the cause of an electrical fault. Here we've got something where each setup is going to be slightly unique. It's been adapted over time. There's no one who's really got the full knowledge of that system. And so this is the type of example of a knowledge-based error. You're not able to find something, but you're working through a very novel and different scenario. Um, Probably the skill-based error, I think, if everybody in this call must have done this at some point, you're just on autopilot, you're going along the road and you just miss your exit. I think that's one that's pretty straightforward to categorize the skill-based error, but if somebody's got a reason why it's not, please discuss what we'll talk about that at the end, I love it. Getting to some sort of more pointy end type errors that we might be looking at and dealing with in an aviation context. I think this one's, I picked out this one because I think it's one that can fall between some of these definitions. So flight with an ejection seat, need to replace the seat pin at the end of the flight. Now, in theory, that's a simple rule-based error. If you've reached the end of the flight, you replace the seat pin. And so it would typically fall into that category. However, as pilots become very experienced, they've undertaken many, many flights in these types of aircraft, it becomes second nature. It starts moving it into that skill-based category of something that's done almost without thought to collect the pin and return it into the seat. Starting to get towards some more specific accident scenarios. Um, see a very well-known maintenance error incident where wrong screws were used to replace the cockpit window. It subsequently blew out in flight. In theory, again, a simple rule-based error. We select this screw type, it's it in there. However, when we start looking at the context of this particular incident and what happened, we know that it was a different, the person who was performing the task was not the person who would typically perform that task. We know that there were similarities in some of the equipment that made them difficult to differentiate, which could actually perhaps put it into a skill-based. So we actually end up with something which looks on the surface quite a simple scenario that could actually be potentially falling into any of these categories of error. Then picked out a few different accident scenarios to try and categorize in this area. So Herald of Free Enterprise, the key sort of error that we might label in this scenario would be um, not closing the door prior to departure. We could think of it as not conducting the check of the door prior to departure. So there's two perhaps different ways we could look at that potential error here. And there's clearly some rules, there's clearly some checking behaviours that would fall into perhaps the category of a skill-based error. A rule-based error would be more of the fact that of the if-then aspect of it. So it could easily be categorised as either of those. However, by doing that, we are really failing to miss, failing to capture the real complexity of this accident scenario. And why, what were the factors that contributed that? The environmental factors, the staffing factors, the whole organizational piece that built up around that scenario that enabled those skill and rule-based errors to creep in. And there was a way to use that to highlight that 
these simple approaches focused on the error, we're missing some of the really critical information. Similarly, with the Kegworth air disaster, the, we can very simply label that as a rule-based error, but again, it's going to miss some of the much bigger contextual factors behind it. Two, I think, should come up both together at the end, which I wanted to flag as potentially a little bit more interesting as ones that maybe more, most clearly fall into a category and in a way that makes it interesting to form some learning. And that of Challenger and Chernobyl as ones that were really on the edges of not people's experience, on the edges of people's understanding and knowledge about the system. And those factors starting to become major contributors to um, the errors that were made. I think those, some of these ones, actually these models can start to be useful because when you look at those and they fall quite clearly into one of the categories that does give you some pointers as to how about how to go about correcting those errors and where mitigations are needed. Second model that I was just going to talk through briefly is uh, James Reason's model of slips and lapses, mistakes and violations. Now, slips and lapses and mistakes fall broadly similar to skill and rule-based errors. So a slip or an apps, reason categorizes an error of action, so of in implementing your chosen behavior, and a mistake is an, an error of decision-making. So a lot of these, certainly missing the exit on the motorway and weighing out the wrong amount of flour on a recipe, very much in that errors of action type of category. Um, I think still ejection seat pin falls perhaps somewhere between the two. Um, but we can start seeing more clearly something like the, um, the cockpit window screws, um, the electrical faults in the house, these are much more than mistakes. What I thought was most interesting about this model to highlight was one of the, was the new category of violations. So here we're talking specifically about rule breaking, um, error, rule breaking actions that could be categorized as violations. And here, what I think is interesting on this topic is how we really define a violation. Um, there are some very clear examples that could be seen as, as a violation. Um, however, in some areas, we start to get into something that's quite gray on that. How much did somebody know about the procedure that they were violating? How much did somebody understand how it related to their context? And it um, starts to be quite an interesting area, I think. But overall across these models, uh, the key point I wanted to highlight is they can be quite interesting. And certainly as a person who likes thinking about human error, I find it kind of interesting to think about them and how it relates to errors that I see, how can I categorize them, what does that tell me? And unfortunately the conclusion I draw is that it tells me something interesting, but not necessarily something useful. When I need, if I want to think about something useful, really they need to understand the context and I need to start understand the wider influences that contributed to that error taking place. And this is where organizational approaches came in to start addressing those limitations in the earlier uh, categorization based models. And these attempt to understand the much broader human causes of error, look beyond the individual at the pointy end who, who we can identify their specific actions as contributing, but seeing the environmental factors, the equipment factors, the supervision, the organizational factors that come together to cause that. These approaches also accept one of the things that I talked about earlier on in the definitions of error, that there are many errors that take place without any consequence. Errors happen all the time, but it's only because of all the multiple layers of protection we have in place that stop those coming together to cause those consequences, which is when we tend to get interesting. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar with the Swiss cheese model, being one of the most famous of these approaches, certainly one of the most well known. I saw a really interesting article on the news today about how it's been applied to the COVID pandemic and how that you can equate those layers of protection to the different things that we now have in our everyday life to, uh, to protect us against that. But also understand that even with those protections in place, there are times when those factors will come together and cause a negative outcome. But these, were, these um, organizational approaches, I think are really important in shifting the emphasis. When we talk about human error and it looks like a convenient label, we're often by nature putting the focus on the user, the person who is probably at most risk of a negative outcome themselves from it and putting the emphasis on their action 
Whereas really we need to look at the much wider system and it's there where we're gonna have the biggest benefit in terms of improving performance and uh, mitigating safety incidents in future. And this is where I'm gonna start diving into the world of design because what I think is, is design plays a really critical role in error prevention and is a, an area that we as engineers can influence and take a practical approach to, to managing the error and really drive those improvements and support those people at the pointy end of the, of the system. Fundamentally, we can do an awful lot to design our errors, design systems where it's not possible for, for errors to make, and particularly those errors that have the most serious consequences. Where that's not possible, we can design the system in a way that promotes the desired behavior, promotes the safe decision, encourages people towards the correct error-free behavior. Where there's still a risk of error, we can also help it easy to detect those, providing warning systems, providing alert systems is one of the most obvious ways. But providing, just providing feedback from a system allows people to spot those errors and make the change. And what's the final part is it's really important that in design we're enabling people to correct those errors when they do occur and give people an opportunity to prevent those from realising the negative consequences. Um, so how to do that? Um, when I, one, of, one of my favourite pieces of advice that was ever given to me was, if you're not sure where to start, start with a task analysis. I've kept that with me throughout my career and it's something that's helped me in many situations when the complexity looks too much and you're not really sure where to start on a problem, start by understanding the tasks. And by that I mean looking at what we're, the person is trying to achieve and what are the steps they need to perform to achieve that. And once you've got that understanding, you've really got a basis to start looking at the design of the system and looking at how we can manage error effectively. While that's a good starting point, the one I would also add to that is understand your user. Make sure you know what they're doing, but make sure you know who is doing it, because that can have a big impact on the likelihood of error and how you might want to go and manage that error. Once you understand that though, that's not enough on its own. You've then got to design the system with that user in mind and thinking about their tasks. And it's really important to be bringing the user along on that journey with you, because by keeping them in check with what you're looking at in the design process, that's really where you'll be able to help um, shape the process, shape the design and shape the outcome to be a more error tolerant way. One point I particularly want to pick up in that is the idea of mental models. So that is like our internal representation of something that we're looking at, how we're seeing the world, how we're seeing our actions. And one thing that I, in my experience from the accident investigation side, see a common theme coming up is a mismatch of the mental model between the person performing the action and either the person who set the task, the person designed the system, or just even simply from how the system operates. Because those, those mismatches are really powerful. They drive our behavior, they drive our thinking. And so when we, if we have a misunderstanding fundamentally of how the system is operating, we're much more likely to create an error. I think by involving the users through the design process and engaging with users on their tasks and understanding it from their perspective, we can ha have a good chance of getting the user's mental model in the right place, but also designing our system so that we're, we're reflecting their mental model as well. And, uh, I really would flag that as one of my critical kind of perspectives on error, error management, I think. The other main, the other most obvious category is to minimize the error producing conditions. The good academic work that's been done in the world of human factors has identified a number of specific attributes that we can identify that increase the risk of error. Those are things in the environment, such as stressors, heat, noise, temperature, they can all contribute to error. There are aspects of design of systems, how we present information. There are aspects of the processes and the systems and keeping those consistent. And um, all of that can come together to quite considerably increase the risk of error. And something I think we need to bear in mind throughout the design process is how we can minimize those. So we're setting our users up to succeed. The final stage of what I think is important when we're thinking about error in design is to where we have something that we are particularly concerned of, don't be afraid to conduct the human error analysis, to dig into that based on the task analysis, 
break it down into the potential errors. Because by going into that extra level of detail where we've got a particular area of concern, we've got scope to identify any specific mitigations and provide that assurance and check that the design is meeting its requirements. So that kind of sounds like quite a high level process. And a lot of us um, in our roles will not be directly involved in the design. But even once the system is in use, um, you've got a chance to identify, detect and correct errors. And I think that process continuing through test and into service is really important. And what I wanted to share in the um, next few slides are some of my favourite tips for spotting human error. And I kind of, I, I subtitle these as my top five signs your design isn't working. First one is if you make an error once, maybe it was just you. You make an error twice, you need to start looking at why that happened. And there can many cues that can be things that were leading, just leading you down that path to increase the likelihood of error. And if you're seeing things happen more than once, I think that's something we need to be dug into, look at. Uh, I put a nice sort of simple example there of how, how design could be directing you into that error and something that you could easily be slipping into accidents on. So uh, as an activity, I decided to unsubscribe from all the emails that were annoying me. At one lockdown, we've needed activities to keep ourselves busy. And uh, I was really interested to see some of the ways that that process worked. And uh, this was a genuine example where you click on unsubscribe, and the submit option was to subscribe yourself to the list. So just that gently nudging you into that particular behavior, which in my, in my context for what I was trying to achieve was an error. So if you start making these mistakes more than once and you still keep getting emails after you've unsubscribed, look a little bit closer, try and dig and find out what's causing that. Probably one of the most classic and well-known ways of spotting error issues in design is all of the where in all the wrong places. Uh, behind that tree is an entrance to a hotel. Here I am stood in the car park and on my route are two muddy patches through a patch of grass to get me to the other side. Um, it's, very, it's a very well-known example, but I think it's important to look for it in other contexts as well. If you're seeing parts of your system wearing in ways that you're expected, you notice certain, certain labels or wearing off particular controls, consider what that means and what that can be done to, to address that. My third tip, homemade labels. Very famously um, in the Three Mile Island um, incident, there were labels that they decided they, the work, the, team in the control room had put on a lot of controls to help them differentiate between them. This, uh, this example is a more simple set of light switches. Light switches are one of my favorite places for bad design for people who've to me. So here we've got a set of lights They're on, an, on a door just before you went outside. But the one in the middle was for the room you were in. But the ones on either side were for different lights outside. Um, clearly some different layout of those controls would enable those to be better differentiated and better understood. Um, but whenever we see people putting homemade labels on it, that's, that's people trying to adapt their environment to reduce their risk of error. We should be taking note of that as designers and seeing what we can do. What's it doing? So it's a phrase that is well known from um, Sadly, cockpit voice recorders hear, hear it quite frequently in those recordings, wondering what the system is doing. I say it to my car a lot. I say it to my phone a lot as well. Things, it, something beeps at me, something comes up and you think, why is it decided to do that? If you find yourself saying, what's it doing? You almost certainly have a mismatch between them, your mental model and how the system is operating. Certainly a gap between them, if not a mismatch. And so it's always one. You find yourself saying that, start questioning why. And similarly to the homemade labels, but perhaps taking things a little bit further, is uh, the homemade tools. The thing that you found to make this thing work that wasn't quite working. Um, 
The example in this photo is a, a fridge that had a really neat feature after you close the door, it seals till it gets back up to temperature. So it's really energy efficient. However, often you need to get more than one thing out of the freezer, the fridge in quick succession. So this, uh, I think it's a letter opener that was left next to the fridge. So enable you to jimmy the, jimmy the seal and get into it when you needed to. Um, but I think I think we could all think of examples or probably around our home in our garden where we've invented a tool to get around a problem. While that might be OK in our homes, although I do love ergonomics of home designs. Um, when we're looking at these safety critical systems, those aren't those aren't suitable and we need to be looking into those into understanding why and correcting those issues to support poor performance. So, got kind of just a little summary here of what I felt were kind of the key points that I wanted to highlight from this short introduction to the world of human error. Um, human factors is all about the interaction between users and equipment, which is perhaps what we think of most typically, but much more importantly, the wider systems in which they operate, the environment, the processes, um, all of that coming together to influence the user. Human error sounds like a nice simple label that we could put on something that we see taking place. But as soon as we start scratching the soft surface, it gets pretty difficult to define. And the reason for that really is because error in the types of complex systems that human factor specialists tend to work in, and certainly in the world of aerospace systems, those don't just errors arrive, they don't just come from the result of human action. They're about those latent conditions in the supervision, the environment, the organizational factors. And therefore we really need to be alert to human error, not explain it away when we see it. Our brains are quite good at this, it's fine, we'll just move on. But trying to dig into it and scratch beneath the surface and understand what it is that's causing that error from take place. And recognizing that system design is a big part of why error happens and that there's a lot that we can do as designers to mitigate that. But most importantly, if I have one takeaway from this, let's say when we identify a human error, the most important question we can ask is why? Because it's only by understanding that why that we can make the changes to improve performance, support our users and minimize error. I always like to finish when I'm giving a presentation on some suggestions for further reading. Um, as I've picked out a few of my, my favorite books that cover topics of human error. Um, Richard Feynman's book, if you're familiar with it, is his um, memoirs of working on the Challenger investigation. Um, fantastic, engaging writer and um, really insightful um, analysis of the errors associated with that incident. Don Norman's Design of Everyday Things is one of the books that really inspires me about human factors and ergonomics. And it really brings very complex approaches in psychology and human factors and relates them to very everyday scenarios and makes them really engaging and easy to understand. We've talked a lot about error, but I did also want to flag up James Reason's book, The Human Contribution, because while we tend have a tendency to focus on the human role in in, in error and how we can reduce that. It's really important to recognize that humans have a role in recovery and in overcoming potentially challenging scenarios. And one of the um, incidents he looks at them there is the uh, cockpit, uh, cockpit windscreen blowout. And he talks about the actions of the crew and how they recovered from that scenario. I think it's a really um, interesting and important book to see both sides of the human error story. Um, some slightly more technical ones on the final end of the slide. Um, Wiegmann and Chappelle's human error approach is um, the HFACS, uh, description of the HFACS um, accident analysis process, which um, really breaks down James Reason's Swiss cheese model to a much finer level of detail and tries to define what those holes are in the cheese with a particular focus on aviation. And is um, although it's quite an academic text, it's a really, really valuable read. And a final plug for the book on the far right hand side, um, the uh, aerospace medicine notes. Uh, some of the fact things I've been talking about today are drawn from the chapter that I contributed to that on human error. And uh, as a 
for those people who aren't aviation medicine specialists but want an overview of the topic so I think it's a really lovely book it's quite concise and direct on a really broad range of topics related to aviation medicine of which obviously human factors are the key part um, that completes the formal side of the presentation um, I'm going to adjust my screen around so I can see if there's any questions that have come in but if obviously really happy to answer anything that people have. <laughs>